Hey, thanks for watching this video. This is one class from the 2022 HVACR Symposium in Claremont, Florida. We have the symposium every year, and so to find out more information kind of upcoming, go to hvacrschool.com slash symposium. Big thanks to our sponsors for this event, which was AccuTools and TrueTech Tools. They're the two title sponsors that made the event possible. This class is with John Chavez. John Chavez is a past guest on the podcast. He's done a lot in the ductless and VRF space. And in this class, he talks about some of the very basics of VRF for people who are interested in that segment of the industry. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the class. Uh, this class is uh, Introduction to VRF, Variable Refrigerant Flow. And uh, I've spoken to a few of you here. Um, who, uh, by show of hands, who has uh, installed a VRF system previously? All right. What about service? OK, right on. Cool. OK, this class is non-commercialized as uh, much as we possibly can. I'll answer any of your questions. So I may bring up uh, some products. But uh, this is a discussion just about the technology in general. Uh, my name is John Chavez. Uh, this is a little piece of my resume. Uh, but I just want to call attention to um, these areas here. So I've been a ductless aficionado for quite a while. And uh, you know anything to get me out of the attic, right? Uh, anything that can get me uh, away from sheet metal you know, and meat hooks. So I fell in love with this uh, technology pretty quickly and went from, uh, as a contractor, went from 90% air side to 90% ductless in one year and never looked back. I'm here in the capacity of a licensed HVAC consultant. So um, uh, during my time as a consultant, customers call me for problem projects, you know, exclusively. So that was kind of my niche, you know. Imagine you having the most vexing, problematic, angry customer, you know, two, three, even four years in. You know, manufacturers called me, uh, owners called me, attorneys have called me, you know, architects. So it's kind of a special niche. Just to let you know, you're in good hands today. Uh, here's some of the, you know, this is these are all guesstimates, you know. I mean, I don't know how accurate it is, but. Um, I've represented in the capacity of as a manufacturer's agent these products. So I've had factory training uh, uh, from the factory, not on the contractor side. So um, feel free to ask any questions uh, during this presentation. We've got plenty of time. And uh, anybody on LinkedIn, you can find me here. And uh, you know, we can continue. I love talking shop, so you can always just uh, shoot me a DM or what have you. All right, today's discussion topics is uh, what is VRF, VRV technology. Uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, manufacturers and key differences. What are the essential features, right, of VR, uh, VRF, variable refrigerant flow? Uh, how do they work? Uh, we're going to review the components, applications, and design advantages. It's, it's going to sound a little sales, sales pitchy, but uh, don't worry, I'm not trying to sell you anything. If anything, I'm just trying to sell the concept. And then service and maintenance. So there's a very short uh, section on that just to get a general overview. Um, typically, I give this class, uh, this discussion for people that are not even in the air conditioning industry. All right, so uh, VRF technology, right? We're used to understanding that you can uh, hook up multi-zone systems with one outdoor unit. And uh, I got to tell you, it's not your typical heat pump. And they're all heat pumps. Uh, the capabilities of some of these systems are extraordinary. You can achieve 100% cooling capacity down to maybe 10, uh, negative 10 degrees, maybe even negative 20, um, and uh, have uh, maybe 78% heating capacity down to 
um, negative 13 degrees, there are some that can go 100% heating capacity. That's without any supplemental uh, electric heat. This is just heat pump. Usually where, you know, if you've been in the industry, uh, you know that heat pumps usually fail. That's a lot sooner than these numbers. And uh, just to, you know, I, I like to d uh, simplify things um, as soon as I understand them. Uh, I find that people like to make uh, things more complicated than they are. Me being one of them, if you ask me what time it is, I'll tell you how to build a watch, you know, but I'm trying to refine that. And this is one of the refinements, you know. It's just software driving the hardware that you already know. Does that help? You know, it's just software. We're going to talk about the software a little bit, but, you know, it still has a compressor. It still has solenoids, expansion valves, accumulator, uh, temperature sensors, pressure sensors. So just a little background here. The first installation uh, for VRF was approximately in 1982. And uh, there are, I think this number's low, actually. It's hard to get a good number, but there's more than 10 million installations worldwide. As a matter of fact, in uh, third world countries, many splits and multi-zones are almost, you know, 100%, maybe like 90, nobody likes to say 100%, but, you know, 95% of how uh, they get heating and cooling. And in Europe, it's the adoption is something like 85 to 90. They call it chiller killers over there because in the 90s and the early 2000s, chillers were going out the door and VRF was coming in the door. And in Asia, uh, it's 85, 90%. You can actually go in th some third world uh, countries and buy your milk and bread and a mini split all in the same place. So if you're worried about uh, adoption, this is a brand new subject. You're not sure uh, you know, about it. You, you don't know if you want it in your, uh, if you don't want to uh, suggest it or recommend it. Um, in 2012, ASHRAE, um, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, which is our uh, main institution uh, published chapter 18 on rever uh, variable uh, refrigerant flow, and uh, they've uh, every if, if you know the ASHRAE publishes these books. Um, uh, there are four books, and there's a new one published every year, so it's a four-year adoption, and you can go find it. Uh, you could read it online. Um, I think there's actually a PDF available in there, so you don't have to buy the whole book. But if you wanted to, uh, you know, learn more about it, and uh, instead of watching cartoons and eating cereal on Saturday mornings, you know, maybe you can uh, understand more about the VRF technology because that's this. You know, our industry is going towards inverter-driven compressors, and so the more you can understand that, the do's and don'ts. Chips, uh, uh, tips and tricks, the better off you'll be and uh, potentially have some earning power. Because um, if you don't know, then you're either going to make a costly mistake or you're not going to be able to talk about it and your competitor will. All right, so for me, how I like to learn is the words, right? What are the buzzwords? What are the keywords? And um, that helps me understand whatever subject matter I'm having to be uh, learning. So we're going to go over some terminology, not too much, but just enough so we can all be on the same page. So the first one is uh, VRF versus VRV. There is no difference. It's exactly the same. It's just a, a marketing term. And uh, VRV stands for variable refrigerant volume. And there's one specific manufacturer who utilize this terminology, but it's exactly the same as uh, variable refrigerant flow, okay? And uh, we won't go through this whole list, but um, the second one there, EEV and LEV, there's one manufacturer that uses LEV, but it's an EEV. And by the way, if you go to my LinkedIn uh, page, you can download this presentation. So, yeah, there's really nothing here that is uh, uh, not already publicized out there, widely available. I've just kind of collated. Um, 
heat recovery. Uh, that's how you get simultaneous heating and cooling. We're going to go over that in a section. And then the variable aspect is, you know, equals modulating. Uh, you can see the modulating compressor, uh, an EEV is a stepper motor. It modulates. Fan is a, a BLDC motor, um, a brushless, brushless DC motor. And uh, you could have a, a multi-speed indoor fan. Here's some other basic terminology, um, which we'll go over the single phase and the three phase outdoor units. But uh, in uh, our industry, they call mini splits or single zones, ductless, duck free split, DFS. In Asia, they just call it a split or a split clima, you know. So, um, and then a multi zone or a multi head. Uh, can typically, this is in a residential application, typically not commercial. Uh, you have maybe eight to one. Uh, eight indoor units can be attached up to uh, one, uh, eight indoor units to one in, uh, outdoor unit. And then you have branch boxes. Uh, so the si system architecture. So uh, this is just a general ov overview of um, a narrative and how this system operates in very general terms. So just look at it this way. A system of singular or modular heat pumps, you know, more than one, uh, with indoor fan coils, which are connected by a common system of control and a common set of refrigeration piping. So common control, common. Basically, this is a typical diagram of a heat recovery system. It gives you a very good kind of illustration of that. The refrigerant is passed through a series of fan coils by means of a variable refrigerant, a uh, variable speed compressor, and metered by an electronic expansion valve that regulates refrigerant flow to accommodate the comfort set point for individual zones. So basically, when you look at a multi zone or a VRF system, each indoor unit is a single zone to the outdoor unit, right? Each indoor unit is its own zone. The variable speed compressor increases or decreases the system capacity to satisfy the individual load requirements, resulting in uh, lower elect uh, electricity consumption. So if you have a high load in a space, the compressor is going to ramp up, deliver refrigerant to that indoor head, Indoor head will uh, satisfy the space. As soon as the space is satisfied, then the compressor will ramp down. Uh, the refrigerant uh, into that coil will be reduced, and thus all that energy can either be put into a new, uh, uh, into another uh, indoor unit, or uh, the compressor will just ramp down to off. And so that's how uh, you can have. Um, full and part load efficiencies. Uh, one manufacturer coined this term, you know, personalized comfort. So personalized zone level comfort control. That's, that's how we can look at uh, each indoor unit. The software programming in the outdoor unit continually scans approximately 250 data points to meet predefined target temperatures and pressures. Okay, these are already written and uh, instead of saying software program, we could say algorithms. So what is an algorithm? Well, bas basically, it's just a set of instructions. If this, do that, you know? And um, the best uh, analogy I can give to that is, uh, actually, it's a story. Uh, I was called out on a uh, eight-story hotel in Dallas, Texas. Uh, it was a uh, the summer that we had over 100 days with 100 degrees. And um, the system wasn't keeping up. The VRF system was cooling the common areas. And uh, so I got called out and uh, looked at uh, the remote control, and it said 74 degrees. So it was 74 degrees. They had it. They wanted it at 72, and you know it was a little, it was a little uncomfortable, slightly, you know, not not like the lobby. And um, 
so we made it the way to the roof, and I saw a, a condenser farm of condensers walk towards them. And as I walked towards them, I walked past them, and then looked from the rear, and I saw a bunch of goosenecks. Laundry vents. <laughs> so as I approached the condensers, I started, they're usually blue, but these were like a gray. And sure enough, all the lint was completely perfectly coated over the uh, coil. And you, know, you could just peel it off perfectly. Now imagine a typical air conditioning system coated with lint, you know, maybe half inch thick. What would happen? Something, right? You, you wouldn't be cooling. But because of the algorithms, the software programming, the discharge uh, temperature uh, is monitored, and uh, the system just lowered the uh, compressor, increased the fan motor to maintain that discharge temperature in its uh, happy spot, right? Um, which can be you know, somewhere between 160 and 220 degrees, depending. So uh, was that a good uh, kind of understanding of how the software can work? Yeah. Um, set of instructions. Again, just to kind of simplify it, uh, the software is a conductor in a sophisticated symphony. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's the components you know, applied science, and mechanical and electrical engineering. All right, so we have heat pump, and then we have heat pump with heat recovery. So with a heat pump, you have three general components. You have the outdoor unit, and the indoor units, and the controls. Pretty straightforward. Right? You got uh, one mode at a time. But everybody has their own control. So you have one mode at a time. First, typically, first mode wins. There's a lot of strategies to manage the mode call. We're not going to go over that today, but there are. But generally speaking, uh, first mode call, uh, wins. So if uh, somebody gets there in the morning or turns on heat, then it's going to be heat until specific criteria is met for it to do system changeover. So a heat pump is a reverse cycle refrigeration system that provides cooling and heating from a single compressor. The ver reverse operation is achieved by one key component called the reversing valve. The reversing valve channels the refrigerant to be superheated or subcooled at either the indoor unit or the outdoor unit. Most of us understand that. In cool mode, the indoor unit ca uh, contains uh, superheated vapor, and the outdoor unit contains subcooled liquid. In heat mode, it's the reversed. And so here's an illustration of a very typical refrigeration system. Um, this is not a heat pump. This is just a refrigeration system. The Achilles, however, the Achilles heel for a conventional heat pump uh, system is its inability to provide heating or cooling at low outside air temperatures. Typically, the heat pump will start to have diminished capacity around 55 degrees outside air. However, uh, VRF, VRV technology uses the reverse, reverse cycle heat pump and supercharges it by optimizing the following. So each one of these components is uh, monitored and manipulated by the software. Through this finely tuned refrigerant and electrical management, VRF, VRV systems are able to operate 100% capacity in either heat or cool mode at outside air temperatures ranging from negative uh, 5 degrees to uh, 115 degrees, respectively. There are other systems that can uh, perform even greater. Um, they were talking about a system that can do 100% cooling at negative 40, you know? So these are just general numbers, you know? Again, I'm not talking about any one specific, but when you engage a sales engineer or an HVAC designer about the VRF, you're gonna wanna know what its capabilities are and then whatever that published data is, that's what the manufacturer should guarantee. Heat recovery. Uh, all v uh, VRF and VRV systems are heat pumps, okay? For heat recovery systems, there is an added component which is required uh, for the system to provide simultaneous heating and cooling with only one outdoor unit. So you have 
one outdoor unit that can provide multiple indoor units and you get simultaneous, you can have cool and heat in two different units with one outdoor unit. So that added component is here. So in a refrigeration system during a call for cooling, the outdoor coil takes superheated saturated refrigerant gas and phase changes it to subcooled uh, liquid, uh, well, subcooling the gas into a liquid. In this process, the refrigerant gives off energy absorbed from the uh, indoor coil uh, during cooling and then transfers that to the condenser coil as uh, a heated air, right? We all understand that or we're, <laughs> we're beginning to understand that? Well, with the heat recovery system, that potential heat energy, which is normally ejected into the atmosphere, is uh, re re rerouted as subcooled liquid and can either be stored or used um, by the heat recovery box. The, this rerouting of the refrigerant is achieved by a component by many names for now. We'll just call it heat recovery box. We'll go over the different names in a later section. The heat, pump, uh, the heat recovery box is uh, directly controlled by the outdoor unit. So if you have a heat, heat recovery box, the outdoor unit, it's an extension of the outdoor unit. Uh, it contains components such as a liquid gas separator, thermistors, solenoids, ports, EEVs, and manifolds. All these uh, components are monitored by the, and controlled by the software. So this is um, an illustration, and these are the different names that different manufacturers use. But it's the same thing. They are constructed and designed differently, but essentially um, they perform the same work. And they're, uh, in this category of heat recovery, there are two different styles. You have a three-pipe system, and then you have a two-pipe system. So you could have two-pipe heat recovery or three-pipe heat recovery. And um, there's a lot of arguments, you know, which one is better, what have you. It really depends on the job. There's arguments for both. Both work, generally speaking, fine if you go with the top names. Um, but um, there are some, some strong arguments that the two-pipe heat recovery can save time and uh, less uh, first costs because typically um, with one manufacturer in particular that I know for sure is that you can run soft copper uh, instead uh, from after the first connection, which uh, soft copper is less expensive than ACR, you know, by weight, not by foot, by weight. And uh, it's my understanding that if you have a three pipe, it's all a very he heavily engineered system and uh, they do recommend, if not require, um, ACR piping, which means you have a lot more uh, potential for leaks, right? Because you have more braze connections. So, you know, get with your designer or sales engineer before making any of those decisions. So what are the key uh, features? You can mi mix and match indoor units. Uh, we're going to go over the different styles that are available for VRF. Uh, Inverter-driven scroll compressors. Um, you know, scroll has been very good to our industry. Um, it's a very robust and reliable uh, way to um, pump refrigerant. And uh, you can have up to 150% connected capacity. So connected capacity, what that is, is that let's say you have a 10-ton outdoor unit. You can connect, in this case, at 150%, 15 tons of indoor unit. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get 15 tons of energy out of it because you only have a 10-ton outdoor unit. The connected capacity of that 15 tons is going to be, that energy will be shared. Now, um, my personal experience is that you really don't want to go any more than maybe 10 or 12 percent, something like that. But um, you really have to know your building well to... Uh, uh, strategize what is called diversity, right? Because uh, a building uh, is not 
100% uh, used all the time. You know, there's sections, people move around houses, right, in the daytime, in the nighttime, people are in the bedrooms, in the nighttime people come out. You know, same thing with a commercial building. So there are things that you can, uh, some assumptions that you can put into your design. But like in Phoenix, Arizona, the, uh, you know, there's no diversity. It's just hot, you know. So be careful. But one thing that uh, you can have um, up to potentially 50 indoor units on one outdoor unit, which would make it somewhere around uh, maybe uh, seven or 8,000 BTU indoor units, you know. I've personally never seen that. The most I've seen is maybe 36, something like that. Average maybe 20 to 25, something between outdoor units. Um, Remember, you're sharing that energy with the, the space. So uh, the building load profile with the distributor capacity, uh, the refrigerant energy is shared among the indoor units. So when one unit is satisfied, the other units can make use of that energy. There's also solar diversity, you know, so uh, typically north-facing buildings um, are going to require less heating, uh, less cooling. Um, than south facing, so there's a lot to know about your application. Uh, so there are two or three pipe systems, two wire uh, digital direct control network, which is just, um, you know, it could be shielded or unshielded cable, and you just daisy chain, and that's the communication system. Some manufacturers were, are polarized, so you have to land them at uh, the specific terminals. Others are nonpolar, so it doesn't matter. Um, but it's all integrated. And if you've ever built up a chiller system or uh, built up a HVAC system, you, uh, you, know, you know that you need to buy all these disparate components and put them all together. One of the benefits with VRF is that it's integrated, so you get you know, not, not only the heat and cooling power, but um, the DDC network. Integrated controls, which we'll go over, and uh, BACnet and long works. So um, <clears throat> I work on uh, high-end homes I'm called into, and, you know, everybody wants to do uh, Crestron or uh, some, uh, you know, new automated system, and uh, more and more they're choosing... VRF systems to marry with their home automation system. So individual uh, zone control, flexibility in design. What's interesting about these systems is that there are ways you can manipulate the software by the use of dip switches. And there's a number of times when you can do all the preparation <laughs> that you want, but when you get to the job, something has changed and uh, now that particular zone is not uh, working as expected. So by using dip switches, you know, I've got out of trouble. I've got helped other people get out of trouble. Um, just that uh, your conventional systems just can't do that. You know, not yet, anyways. The other thing about the flexibility in design is that you can choose whatever uh, di different models that are available. So in this case, we're in this photograph, we're looking at the one-way uh, cassette. But as we'll go over, there are a number of um, heads and sizes. And then simultaneous heating and cooling. So this is a uh, just generalization, you know. This is not from any one manufacturer, but typically speaking, um, you can have, um, you know, maybe a combined 3,300 feet of piping on a single system. With these uh, vertical lifts, this is where, uh, you know, without practice, uh, you can make mistakes. But luckily, um, we're going to talk about the selection software. And every manufacturer has some sort of selection software that can keep you out of trouble. But these are some pretty incredible lengths, wouldn't you agree? So the scale of economy, if you're looking at it um, in terms of uh, roof space, um, to the right here, we have RTUs. 
and these are condensers here. And this is a uh, chiller system. This is a um, air-cooled chiller, water-cooled chiller, and this is 80 tons of VRF. At one time, uh, uh, there was a outdoor unit, and there may still be, that can f uh, of this size, of this chassis, that can fit into an elevator. And if you're doing a retrofit, you know, that could be pretty helpful. But just to kind of understand the differences between um, refrigerant and air and water, you can see here by this uh, illustration uh, how much physical space is needed to achieve the same work. So in terms of um, transfer of heat abilities, uh, refrigerant, R410A, is 10 times more, uh, more, has more heat transfer than chilled water and 190 times more heat transfer than air. Is that surprising to you? No? Yeah. Everybody knew that. So um, the argument for uh, reducing the total size of any building. I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, I've worked in Beverly Hills, Bel Air, you know, Austin, Atlanta, you know, um, upstate New York. They always want us to put 10 pounds of rocks into a five-pound bag. If you're on residential... Um, you know, you're hard pressed if you're going to get any kind of mechanical drawings, you know. Um, and space is a huge concern. But with uh, VRF or ductless technology in general, uh, here you can see illustrated uh, what is required. And there is an argument that if you have a 10 story tall building, that you may be to lose and not pay for one full story of it just because of the ductwork that you're not installing. Uh, here we have an example uh, indoor unit that is about um, eight inches tall. This is the ducted unit. Um, medium static, which is about 0.6 ESP. So lower um, structural costs. Uh, this slide is, you know, admittingly, for architects more than contractors, but just gives you uh, kind of a dollar amount of what can be saved uh, with VRF as your baseline. So integrated controls, um, like I said, uh, two-wire polar or non-polarized uh, communication bus. Um, uh, these integrated systems can uh, have the potential to control pumps and parking lights and uh, other on and off um, emergency lights, uh, maybe not fire safety, but a lot of other things. So it has that uh, opportunity built in. And then just the sound, I mean, uh, you, you know, we're, we're used to listening to anywhere from 75 to 85 decibels, you know, with an outdoor unit. As a matter of fact, this is this is at high. This, these indoor units, this um, decibel rating is at high fan, and typically there's three to five fan speeds. So at the lowest fan speed, it's probably somewhere around 20 dBs. And um, you can, with a couple of dip switches, you can set the outdoor unit to be somewhere in the 50s. You're reducing the capacity. All you're doing is putting a governor on the compressor, but it's possible. So energy efficient, um, system automatically matches the zone load, adjusts the capacity and thereby energy consumption, adjusts the compressor fan speed and, uh, and uh, compressor and fan speed, improves temperature control resulting in more comfortable spaces. So soft starts, you know, um, if you have, um, or if you're working with any solar people, this is one of the reasons why mini splits are so popular with them. Because when you design a solar system, you're, you're looking at all the loads and the lock rotor or induction motor uh, is going to be a big load. Could be 30% of the load. So solar guys love us. Um, also for retrofit, you know, you may not have to 
date the um, circuit breaker capacity. You know, that's a big deal, right? Chiller versus VRF, well, the new chiller may require more energy, right? Instead of using the existing two watt, uh, you know, they have to bring something wire, they have to bring in something more heavy duty. That's a lot of money. You may have to change the transformer. These are all just considerations. I'm not sure uh, how many of you do sales and design, but these are some of the conversations that are happening to promote VRF. Uh, Inverter-driven compressor matches compressor speed to meet full or part load demand. If you find me repeating myself, it's because I'm trying to drive home some key points. You know, off the charts, energy efficiency when in part load conditions. So we're uh, all familiar with SEER ratings, right? Seasonal energy efficiency ratings. Yes? Yeah? Okay. So that is a design condition. Uh, 95 outdoor, uh, 80 degrees dry bulb, 67 wet bulb. Uh, about 40 feet of duct and um, 25 feet of line length with the outdoor indoor unit at a level plane. Now tell me. What job have you installed with that condition? Anybody? Yeah, neither have I. I haven't seen it. I haven't done it. So when you get that SEER rating, it is a uh, snapshot in time. Okay. Um, so what happens when uh, the compressor ramps down to half the hertz, right? Half the speed. What happens to the SEER rating? Does it go down? Does it stay the same? Does it go up? You tell me. Goes up. Uh, they don't uh, necessarily publish that in, uh, information on the residential side, but on the commercial side, there are uh, some closer values, and we'll go over a couple of those. But that's why I wrote this off the charts. So with the target uh, discharge temperatures, uh, they ensure that the compressor has a long life, right? Because um, it seems to me that all the refrigerant components and proper installation and maintenance and refrigerant charging of any particular refrigeration system, whether it's a, a water cooler or a 10,000 a day industrial ice machine, if all those things are to spec, that the compressor is happy, you know? And so one of the ways to discover the, the compressor's uh, operating performance is managing and understanding the target discharge temperatures for that particular design. So um, that's where that Dallas story of this hotel came to mind. So you've probably seen this before. Uh, this is a very old kind of slide, but um, basically when the compressor starts, it just turns on, then it, room temperature starts to come down, it ramps up, it can go up to 120 hertz, you know, delivering that refrigerant very fast to the indoor coils. Then the temperature just um, rides on that line and so the compressor goes down to half the speed. And that's, you know, a little cartoon of uh, <laughs> what we're trying to promote in this space. So this concept works with single zone uh, mini splits to VRF as well. And, uh, you know, any uh, inverter driven compressor, you know, whether it's uh, conventional unitary systems or not. This is what we're trying to achieve and save electricity. So compressors, soft start, you have a high power factor, which is good, and a low reactive uh, factor, uh, po reactive power, which is great. Um, compressor capacity reduction equals lower kilowatt usage. Precise temperature control nearly uh, eliminates wild temperature springs. So. The only precise part of it is that the thermistors are fast reacting. Um, it will sense a, a load change very quickly. 
And that could work for your disadvantage if it's installed incorrectly. For instance, if you install an indoor unit and it's a high, a high wall unit and a certain part of the day the sun beats on it, well, it's going to overcool, right, because it thinks it's too hot. You have to strategize where you're going to be um, sensing temperature. With these systems, you can sense temperature from the indoor unit. You can sense temperature from the remote. You can have a remote sensor. Um, so it's, um, you have a number of uh, choices. So in terms of um, the SEER rating, the SEER rating for a commercial VRF is uh, AHRI standard 2030. And um, it takes these conditions here and averages them. And this is supposed to be a swath between uh, you know, all gen like four different climates. So they're doing their best, but it, it, it tells a little better story than SEER rating, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And you know, what happens when uh, you have a simultaneous heating and cooling system and you have both heating and uh, equal amount of heating and equal amount of cooling being called. Well, there's uh, system efficiencies with that. And so um, you have this uh, curve here that you know, people can design their uh, system around their building. And then uh, utilizing an energy model, um, have some kind of predictive uh, understanding of how much money they're going to spend over the lifetime of their equipment. So I was uh, attending an ASHRAE luncheon. You know, they have them once a month. And uh, they had a panel. This is like 10 years ago. A panel of a bunch of Texas contractors. And one thing that uh, stood out to me is this statement here. Uh, so Mitsubishi, uh, that's my first manufacturer call out because it, it's the only one that I know for sure. They published that they have a um, half a percent warranty return rate. I mean, that's what they tell people. Um, but if it's installed correctly, it's bulletproof. And that's from one of the largest Texas contractors. So a uh, life cycle, uh, it's very uh, much uh, a lower uh, life cycle costs are much uh, more achieved with VRF. Um, why? The cost of HVAC system is more than just the cost of design, equipment, and installation. It's, you've got to consider the operation, the service, the maintenance, and replacement as part of the total cost. Uh, VRF zone systems are more efficient, easier to design, takes less time to install, and require less maintenance. And in our service and maintenance section, you'll see why. So how do they work? It's called a block diagram, uh, typically used for uh, designing controls. So you have the indoor unit, and you have the remote controller set point. So it's not a thermostat, it's a remote controller. Um, a, rem a remote controller does much, much more than a thermostat. Thermostat's a 24 volt on off device, uh, typically. Um, and a remote controller can control vanes, can uh, port air messages, air codes. You know, it does a lot more than just a typical thermostat. Uh, but now that we understand what the difference is, we can call it thermostat. That's fine. Um, so you set the set point, and then you have the space air temperature. And that delta, that's what drives the system. Then you have the outdoor unit. So the outdoor unit, and this is for many uh, multi-zones as well, single-phase multi-zones. Uh, you have it's looking at the connected capacity, thermistor readings, the compressor hertz. You could have multiple compressors, and uh, the LEV positions, and it's targeting uh, temperatures and pressures that it's trying to achieve. Is that a pretty good simplified way of understanding? Any questions, sir? I'm sorry, the light is shining in my eye. Yeah. You know, I think the VRF, VRF equipment's really cool, but what about like control boards and stuff like that in harsh environments, the outdoor drive, all the goodies that make it? Yeah, it's like the VRF. Uh, it, you're talking like in an industrial area or? Yeah, 
R residential? Yeah. So beach, okay, I'm glad you said beach because uh, the salt content of the air is going to destroy, you know, a lot, a lot of things, right? I mean, so uh, what I would recommend is that, um, you know, they clean the coils once a month with fresh water only because the, uh, the coil already has a film on it. Um, and then uh, as far as the controls, you can pot the controls, uh, the PCB and potting the board means that you're just putting like a paste on there, a silicone, and uh, you have to remove it and then pot the back of it, put it in the front, and you could put some in the front too. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot more you can do without, yeah. Yeah, but what I find interesting is that the installers, when they put in a system and they run the line sets, uh, they don't cover that penetration well enough. And so you get all kinds of critters and things. And so, um, and yes. Uh, so what I've noticed, because I've traveled overseas for years, yeah. that in Korea, Japan, China, their manufacturers over there, the Yes. And I guess because of cost in our market and our capitalism, whatever, uh, they don't sell it here because of up the price. Of well, yeah, they also don't have UL, so there's a lot of differences. But right on the coast where our unit. You can get that. Thank you for bringing that up. I was. You can have that done. You can. Yeah. With the Gulf Coast. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and some manufacturers will sell you that uh, coating, but you're adding additional time because it's going to be a special order, yeah, and cost. Uh, so you can also coat the coils. Um, there's uh, like an epoxy. Uh, you have to take out, uh, disassemble the coil and dip it is the proper way. If you spray it on, it's going to last maybe two or three years. So you have to come back and retreat it, which may be a maintenance contract. I don't know. Uh, but if you dip it, it's going to last a lot longer. When you're using a sealing cassette, do you have to worry about the heat in the attic in the crawl space? Um, there is a foam that's about maybe an inch thick on there. And it, I, I haven't seen them sweat. So I would say no. You don't have to worry about that. Um, Yes. Is there tricks or do's and don'ts to bring in fresh air? Well, yes. Um, this is a rabbit hole. <laughs> Who wants to talk about fresh air? Show of hands. You got one, two, three. All right, we got enough. All right. So that has nothing to do with fresh air. I didn't. I didn't include fresh air. Is because it's a a half hour minimum to an hour conversation. But uh, my recommendation based on my experience, design experience and project experience, would say you're probably better off with a separate ventilation system. Um, you, you absolutely got to be careful because I'll give you an example. If, if this is a cassette, OK, and I'm looking at the top of it, and here's the bottom, there's going to be one side that's going to have <coughs> the uh, incoming vent, right? Uh, it's going to be four inch or five inch, something like that. Now, that, let's say that's raw air, right? It's filtered. There's like some MERV 8 filter somewhere, and it's, uh, it's not drawing it in. It has to be uh, powered in. And now this connection here, we don't know where the pipe sensors are, but that part of the coil is going to behave and react differently than the rest of the coil. You know? So it isn't evenly distributed. Because in a cassette, it wraps, the coil wraps around. Right? Now, if you have a ducted unit, right, and you have a return air duct, you can uh, install the, vent, uh, the outside air, ventilation air, in the duct. And it, you know, depending, it may just be on one side of the coil. 
But what if that side of the coil is uh, in part load conditions, you know? Do you see where I'm getting? You know, you can have uh, too much uh, air coming in, too much uh, temperature, high temperature, and the system is not going to respond well. Or uh, if it's in part load, then it may respond great in uh, full load conditions, but in part load, it may not take care of the, the air treatment that you need. So I always recommend, you know, if you can afford it, uh, on a residential or a light commercial, you know, get a dedicated uh, dehumidifier, you know, like April Air or, or uh, Santa Fe, something of that nature. Pre-treat it before introducing it into the air conditioning system. Or if you're a commercial, then it would be like an ERV or, or, and or a dedicated LDR system. So basically, this is just a very high overview of the... Uh, electrical system and from uh, the top left to right you have uh, AC to DC and DC to AC right that's an inverter section so the AC voltage gets transferred uh, transformed into DC voltage it's manipulated then it's converted from DC to AC once the voltage is controlled by the software the voltage frequency uh, which in the US is 60 cycles per second, or 60 hertz, can either be increased or decreased to suit the demand. So fun fact, um, nearly all, if not all, uh, single zone ductless mini splits are three phase compressors. Who knew that? Uh, single zone, fun fact, this, is a single zone uh, ductless mini split are typically, all of them are three phase compressors. So yeah, it, uh, one of the lines is a uh, simulated uh, third leg. So, um, you know, in the, in the history of uh, electricity and electronics, uh, a tremendous amount of manipulation has been part of it. I mean, it's uh, electricity is just uh, amazing. And uh, I highly recommend if you plan on staying in this industry for more than five years, that you learn um, uh, computer te uh, terminology and uh, electronic terminology. Because uh, you're going to have to interface at some point with a system. And if you don't understand the words or why they're there or what's going on, uh, you know, it can cost you time and money and maybe even the customer's confidence. I've seen it a lot. Um, so that's my recommendation for the day. As far as treating the control board, can you just use like any kind of coffee? No, sir. So um, I know I could say this with some confidence that whatever... Uh, manufacturer that you're working on. Okay, so Train is Mitsubishi, and I know for a fact that they have a recommended um, tube of uh, silicone that I don't know if you can buy it for them, but I've replaced bores before and it came with it in the box. Yeah, the white paste that goes with your this was clear, but the white paste is the heat sink paste. Yeah, that's, I think that's different. Um, but, um, I always, you know, even if I'm sure, I always like to use whatever the manufacturer represents, right? I don't, I'll, I'll improvise on things that have a very low probability of um, coming back at me, you know? So, um, yeah, get with the manufacturer, but, a uh, question? Sir. With all this in, interconnecting copper and electronics, do you have to worry about uh, lightning strikes? Um, always. No. No, if um, what Florida is the most uh, lightning, okay, in the U.S. Uh, so lightning strikes. Uh, so I've worked on two hotels with lightning strikes, and it's, um, there is no rhyme or reason what happens to the components in a lightning strike. We've had 
Uh, this particular project I'm thinking of had eight uh, systems, so they had eight outdoor units, and uh, it's a four-story hotel, and uh, every room had either nothing wrong with it or something different wrong with it. So it wasn't like a very, um, it took them, it took that contractor two months to, to fix it. They had to shut down for about six weeks, you know. Um, but, you know, had they had some light, lightning arresting apparatus or perhaps maybe even a, a surge protector, which is not the end all be all by no means, but it's better than nothing, they could have saved some, some, uh, some uh, trouble perhaps. But, um, I, I, I have not seen or heard, you know, in all my travels uh, that uh, VRF is any more or less susceptible or will cause an increase of lightning strikes. All right, so um, PID. You know, PID has been around uh, for decades. Manufacturers of whatever widget, you know, food manufacturers, uh, car manufacturers, you know, component manufacturers have used PID in getting their work done. Um, a lot of people use the analogy of a gas pedal. So you have, um, and forgive me if I get this wrong, but it's, it should tell the story, is that uh, you have um, the gas pedal itself, which has a mechanism. Then you have the pressure of your foot, right? And then you have the resistance. So all those things are accounted for in PID, let's just say. And um, so when you look at service manuals or you, you're seeing T1, T2, or T set, or what have you, you know, it's part of the kind of language. And don't get thrown off by it. It's just an engineering way of communicating uh, what to expect, you know? Because remember, an algorithm is a set of instructions to solve a problem. Here's a breakdown of a um, expansion valve. You have typically, a 12-volt power head, 12-volt DC power head. You have the valve body. Um, the stepper motor can go 500 steps or 2,000 steps, depending on what it's doing, how big the system is, where it is in, uh, applied. Um, so, you know, if you think about a thermal expansion valve, um, you know, it's very slow responding and not very finite in its control. Would you agree with that statement? So with a step and mortar, you just have much more control. Uh, then uh, you have what can be referred to as a smart coil. So some coils have up to three sensors in them, an inlet, an outlet, and then a room uh, temperature sen sensor that's con constantly monitoring to keep target superheat or subcooling in line. Key word here is target. And this, yes, sir. Uh, no, not like a regular heat pump. <laughs> it's much more refined. Uh, depending on the manufacturer, you can have a time defrost. That's every eight hours. Uh, some manufacturers will just um, look at the coil and says, hmm, we're a little frosty here. Let's go to defrost, and it can be anywhere from two minutes to four minutes. So I don't need to be uh, snooty <laughs> with your question, but... Uh, what happens yes, so um, the indoor coil fan stops. Yeah. The system is very intelligent in if you want to turn this conversation into what happens when you first start it. Uh, say if you have uh, 20 degrees outside, you don't want to blow cold, right? So the system will uh, increase the compressor speed, um, which can heat up the refrigerant before it's delivered to the space. And at a certain threshold, then the indoor fan will turn on. So at the get-go, you're blowing warm air. All right, so let's go over the components. We have uh, air and water source heat pumps, uh, hybrid VRF, which is already available overseas. Uh, they've been talking about it for five years or more, bringing it here. 
uh, heat recovery systems, indoor fan, coils, um, indoor units, zone control, central control. All right. So typically you have an outdoor system that can be anywhere from 36, uh, 6 to 36 tons. Um, some manufacturers even have larger combined units. Uh, somewhere uh, the voltage 208, 230, or 460 volt, inverter driven scroll compressors. Sound ratings at low as 48 decibels. Um, connected units 50 to 1 and uh, connect up to 130% of indoor unit capacity. You may notice, those who are paying attention, that I'm changing these numbers. It's intentionally. I'm, I'm not trying to be consistent because you need to go out and whatever unit you're going to apply, that's what you should be looking up. If you're designing a system based on this presentation, you're going to get in deep trouble. <laughs> right? This is just all the you know, introduction, right? The essentials. Single phase heat pumps. Um, are available in three, four, four and a half, five, and six tons. There's one manufacturer I know is making a six ton single phase VRF. Um, so 230 volt uh, single phase typically. I'm sorry? <laughs> um, inverter driven compressors and 12 to 1. Um, now there is one manufacturer out there that makes a single phase heat recovery. So now any of you guys working on residential, and you want to put in something real fancy that can uh, delight, you know, the most, uh, uh, you know, demanding of customer. Uh, maybe this is your uh, product. Then we have water source uh, heat pumps and heat recovery. Um, most major, major manufacturers have this product available. So you can imagine that you have a, a, chill, a, a water system and instead of running it through your uh, chiller and boiler, you just uh, run it through the VRF. And if you have a uh, um, ground source heat exchanger, otherwise known as geothermal, you can do that as well. Then you have uh, what is touted as hybrid um, VRF, which is basically using both water and refrigerant. The green here in the illustration is refrigerant. And then you have it can uh, that heat recovery box can produce either uh, cool, chilled water or, or hot water. So the heat recovery box. This is a uh, illustration of just one of the manufacturers that are available out there. Here's another illustration of a different one. They all they come in different sizes. You can have one or up to sixteen indoor units connected. Here's a um, project. You, you can tell it's installed with zero clearance at the top. I'm not saying that that's recommended, but uh, you know you want to read the installation manuals for your your um, prescribed clearances. And this is what that uh, a particular indoor uh, uh, heat recovery box looks like inside. You have a tube and tube heat exchanger here. Your solenoid valves going to your ports and your manifold block here. Uh, then you have your LAV and its sensors. I would advise that you don't be intimidated by this, you know, because uh, th these are, uh, there's a lot of people that have been doing this a long time, good people that can help you get out of trouble. And, um, you know, it's just, at the end of the day, it's just a man-made device that does something pretty cool. And if it's made by man, then it can be fixed by man. Uh, here's a very uh, top uh, level uh, illustration of different heat recovery box strategies. In this case, uh, you could have, um, you know, 16 indoor units with four boxes, uh, heat recovery boxes. You could have one-to-ones, or you could have many-to-one indoor units. All right, so you have the classic uh, high wall mount. Ceiling suspended, and the ceiling suspended, the return is at the bottom, and uh, the supply is this vein here. And you could have zero clearance at the top, and it has a very long throw, maybe 33 feet. 
So if you have a uh, narrow space, this is a great uh, solution you know, for um, maybe schools or um, IT room. I'm not recommending VRF or IT uh, or uh, VRF or ductless for uh, crack rooms, you know, computer uh, room air conditioning. Uh, but, you know, it's going to get done whether or not I recommend it. But this, um, with a long room uh, and it has a high heat load, if you throw the air across, then it will come back hot. And now you are cycling that, you're removing that heat from the space, you know. So if somebody's dead set on putting a VRF or a ductless in a... Um, computer room, this is the one that you may want to look, like, look at, especially if it's a long room. And then the floor standing, these are great for uh, radiator um, replacements. So in the northeast corridor of the United States is our number one, is uh, VRF and ductless number one market because they have very old buildings with no attics, you know, and um, uh, these are very popular there. Uh, also with churches, you can put uh, some of these, uh, you can get uh, a floor standing without the cover and install it into a wall. And some, you can put short ducts on there depending on the product. So it can be hidden in the wall. And if you imagine a church, you know, that has a lot of expensive mill work, you know, they don't want some things sticking out. So you put it in the wall and do uh, you know get very good uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, application? Then you have um, this is a four by four, uh, well three by three, uh, four way cassette, and here's a two by two four way cassette. So you can throw this in a T bar ceiling, a half of a T bar ceiling. You know th this guy's pretty big, so if your ceiling height is uh, anything less than ten feet, you may want to go to this just because it's it's pretty big. Um, and then the one-way cassette, which is uh, great. And when I get a VRF in my house, I'm using all the one-way cassettes. Now, these all have uh, built-in drain pumps. Typically, these do not have built-in drain pumps. You have to add it after. But these have um, built-in drain pumps. And uh, ductless means no duct work for all these reasons. No testing and balancing. There's ducted systems, medium static, low profile, uh, low static, and then the conventional a classic air handling unit. So you have a centralized controller that, t that groups uh, zones together all in one interface. So you, maybe you have 250 indoor units, 256 indoor units, but with a web browser, you can have up to 2,000 units all in one, one uh, computer. So the number one thing that you should uh, remember about service, the number most important thing when you are approaching a system is you have to have patience. All right. If you've never worked on these systems before, um, you're going to need, uh, if you think it's going to take an hour, schedule three. Also, get the manuals. The manuals are your key roadmap. You're going to need a DC voltmeter with uh, 600K ohms. If you're working on VRF, you're going to need a computer because you're going to be interfacing with the computer. Um, some uh, service tools are better uh, looking than others. This is just an example. And uh, please leave your gauges in your truck. Please leave your gauges in the truck. <laughs> Don't bring your, for VRF or ductless, really, leave your gauges. You, you can't control the superheated soap cooling, so I don't know what you're looking at. But here are the players. Names you know. These are the main players, in my opinion. And, you know, five years from now, there's probably going to be Chinese names here. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for watching this video. Again, to find out everything we have going on, you can download the free HVAC School app on Android or on iPhone or go to HVACRschool.com. 
And then specifically up in the top, you'll see events to find out more about upcoming symposiums. Hope to see you there. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.